All right, I'm going to set the tone as we walk into a brand new um, a message that's going to last over a few weeks. I'm going to set the tone today uh, of our series called Relationship Goals by reading from the Word of God, and this is going to be the foundation of what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, that God uh, had created man, but man at this point was still all by himself in the garden in relationship, him and God. So I'm going to pick it up in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18. Then the Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. Isn't that good? So the the Lord God caused the man, verse 21, to fall into a deep sleep while the man slept The Lord God took out of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Verse 22, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. And I love this translation. At last, the man exclaimed. Now, think about it for just a minute. We're going we're gonna to continue to read this. But I, when I read this translation and I saw the phrase, at last, I thought, you know, you got to put yourself in Adam's flip-flops. Well, that giraffe you made, God, was really cool. Oh, man, the horses around here are just spectacular. But this creature... The woman, at last, that's what I've been waiting for. I mean, you got to imagine how Adam must have felt. At last, he exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken from man. Verse 24, this explains... Why man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united in one. Now, I want you to know there's going to be a lot of dots left unconnected today. Because there's going to be some assumptions on my part that you're going to understand some of these things without me even saying it. But in these first six verses... Hopefully, you've got the pattern. God created man. Then he created woman. Then he talks about marriage. Is there anything unclear about that one? God, man, woman, marriage. He didn't create it a different way. So, again, I'm going to leave some dots for you to connect. So we're going to talk about some relationship goals because we've been processing this year about how to become a better version of you in 2019. We believe 2019 is a year of great possibility for all of us. And so we're going to talk about this. When I, when I thought about this particular topic, I actually uh, picked this topic from another church that had done a series like this and used this phrase. This phrase is a popular phrase. For all of you that are on social media, maybe you've come across this phrase because the term hashtag relationship goals has been done over 12 million times. So this is a common language in the social media world where the phrase relationship goals, and people are posting on this relationship goals. And what, they want, what they're saying is, I want some kind of a version. And so what happens is they're posting pictures, and they're saying, boy, here's what my relationship looks like, and people are commenting on it. Boy, I'd like to have a relationship like that, or boy, I w- I'm glad I'm not in that relationship. Boy, that would really stink. And so you've got all of this dialogue going back and forth. And so when you talk about relationship goals, 
Sometimes as a couple or as an individual, and by the way, this is going to be for singles as well as those who are in relationship marriage-wise, we all have some sense of what we're looking for out of life, and when it comes to the relationship goals, people across the scope of humanity, look across the river, look across the greener grass, look across the fence into somebody else's backyard and go, boy, you've got what I would like. And they try to figure out a way to go get what they've got. You've got something that I wish we had, and maybe they institute something into that relationship to try to create something similar. Here's here's one of the pictures. I I found this amazing artist on relationship goals. Here's one of her pictures that she posted. Now, there are people that would look at this picture, and there were people that looked at this picture and went, wow, this is an awesome picture. Wow, I wish I had that kind of a spouse. I wish I had that kind of a boyfriend or a girlfriend that would sit in the snow. Now, I want you to think about this. I don't know where you're from, but I used to live in Buffalo, New York. I can just tell you there's nothing about that photograph that I want. <laughs> because I know what it took to create that photograph. It meant putting on a pair of jeans and sitting down on cold pavement. It meant getting those car lights just right. And the photographer out in front just right. And the snow falling just right. You know how long they probably sat there to take that picture? You know how many times they scooted their rear ends around on that cold road to create this photograph? I don't want that. (laughs) But people... We'll see images like this and go, oh, I wish my honey would sit with me on a cold, frozen pavement until our bottoms are frozen. And you'll you'll forward a picture like this to your significant one and say, this is what I'm looking for. You realize this is a staged photograph, right? For all we know, they could be sitting in a photographer's green room. I don't know. It looks pretty real. But this photographer is pretty amazing. And so it gives us a little bit of idea because people think, man, this is what I want. Here's a picture of a couple. And man, so pretty soon we start to realize sometimes in life things are crafted or images are created And we can get in our minds and in our heart, this is something we want. Here's another good picture that she had on hers. This couple on the edge of the beach, it's nighttime. I mean, I don't know if you can see this picture that good. That dude's got some guns on him. But do you notice all the stars are shining? When you look at this image, all the stars are shining. The water is just right. And there's rain coming down just on the two of them. Isn't that lovely? And and we can look at this picture and go, oh, I want to take a picture like that. Listen, I'm not interested in standing out under the stars and it raining just on me and my wife. But I get you get the picture here. And people post relationship goals. This was a hashtag tag relationship goals photograph and people make comments about it because when you see these things they are nothing more than a photo shoot so be careful of what you want be careful of what you desire to have now I do think they look pretty happy together which is which is cool with me and it could be completely legit it could be husband and wife and it's an awesome picture maybe it's their teenage son took the picture of them uh, and, and I'm good with that so I'm not knocking this But I can just tell you, sometimes in our culture, particularly this next generation, we can look at images of other people and want what they have. And today I want to caution you against that. You know, I'm married. Darlene and I are coming up on our 30th wedding anniversary in December. It's been an amazing run, 30 years. I'm blessed, blessed, blessed. But I can just tell you, Everything about her, I love. I love the way she looks. I love the way she smells. I love the way she laughs. I love the way she talks. I love everything about her. There are some quirky sides to her. 
And there's some unbelievably amazing sides to her. She is a unique person, and God blessed me. She, if you know my wife, you know she's a really amazing cook. She's a very healthy eating person, and so she, she generates that for our family. And those are all wins for me personally. But I also know that when she and I get to spend time together, we, we recently went on a trip together for our 29th wedding anniversary. We, we had missed, I had missed, well not we, I, I had missed three anniversaries, so this is confession time. I had missed three anniversaries in a row. Not that I had missed them. I got her a card, but I, either I wasn't feeling well or we had a church event going. And so I said, I'll make it up to you, and we did this really nice trip. Well, we just, we just completed that trip a few weeks ago, and we had this amazing time. But here's how much I enjoy being with her. When I had to come back to work, Ruby, I was like in a funk. I was like almost in depression because I had gotten to spend so many days with her and now all of a sudden she wasn't there and I had to come in and spend it with people at my office, people that I work with, and they can't compete with my time with her. And although the people I work with are amazing people, it's not her. I love going on car rides with her. One of the things that we love to do is go on a car ride and put, the, uh, put our window shield in and sit in a, in a big parking lot and put our windows down and just eat or drink coffee or something and just sit and talk. We enjoy that. There's a unique bond and relationship that God has blessed me with. I love talking with her about our children. I love talking about the dreams that we have in life. I love talking about all that stuff and doing life with her. Now, that's my relationship. Not yours with her. Does that make sense? Because let me just tell you, you may go, well, pastor, if we could, if my marriage could be like your marriage, man, it would all be so... Man, press pause there. I can paint a really awesome picture of the marriage and this relationship of which I, I am agreeing to. But there's also been times where we've had some intense conversations. And in, by intense conversations, I think those that are married would understand what I mean by those conversations. The last time we had an intense conversation resulted in Darlene getting on her hands and knees and crawling back to me. And here's what she said. On her hands and knees as she crawled, she said, will you get out from underneath the bed and fight like a man? <laughs> Just kidding. It's a joke. That has never happened. It's never happened. But we have had some intense conversations. I mean, it, it could be over silly stuff. How is the dishwasher loaded? I have one way, she has one way. I have one way, she needs to adjust to my way. You get what I'm saying? Listen, Darlene is an incredible cook around our house. I haven't figured it out yet why every dish has to be used to cook. So whatever meal it is, it takes every single dish in the house, every bowl, every spoon, every everything. The beauty is that God put us together. I'm a clean guy. I like to clean. It's therapy for me. See how God does that, though? Again, you can't look at our relationship and go, boy, if we had what you've got, no, you've got what you've got, and praise God for it, man. Your relationship is awesome. But there are times that it may, I may be able to say from here, boy, it, it's so incredible, and I can paint this picture, and I just want to remind you that those conversations do take place. How should the laundry be done? How are we going to handle this situation with the kids? There's times she has an opinion, there's times I have an opinion. Any married couples ever have that situation? And those opinions are different. Yeah. It's the reality of it. Now, you might sit there and go, yeah, but if when that happens in ours, I'm always right. Listen, I'm not always right. She's not always right. Sometimes we're both right, and it's two different things. 
So there can be things like that. There have been some intense conversations over how money has been spent in our home sometimes. There have been intense conversations over how I drive sometimes. So I'm just letting you know that when we talk about relationship goals, this relationship is not your relationship. And I'm not looking across the fence into your backyard going, boy, if I could just have your relationship, if I could just be like you guys. Now, do I believe there are couples ahead of us we can model and we can look at? Yeah, we've had those in our life. Have we maybe been that couple for some? Yes, we have been. And and it's a joy and a privilege to walk that journey with people. But I want to remind you, particularly for those of you that are in a marriage relationship, and I had had the joy of serving at a church. Some of you know my story. When we lived in Buffalo, I was a family pastor, and one of my my things I oversaw were marriages. We had about 3,200 couples, married couples in our church. Uh, That equals a lot of people. And so I got to oversee that. And um, and, and so it meant a lot of different things. I've spent a lot of time with a lot of couples doing a lot of parenting things and marriage things. But I can just tell you, we are not exempt. We have not been given the pass from intense conversations. But I am joyfully blessed in my relationship with my wife. And I want you to be joyfully blessed in your relationship, not in mine, in yours. And I want to make that distinction as we set the table for this, because if we're going to set some relationship goals, then we got to make sure that we're, we're working from the same grid to do that. And here's what I know walking in today. That if you'll hang with this for the next few weeks, you're going to learn some things that will change your life in relationships. And again, if you're single, it'll change them. If you're married, it will change them. And by the way, you could be single and looking, and you can be single and not looking. I just want to help you when it comes to relationships. Today, I have a little bit more of a bent. I'm leaning in a little bit more towards the marriage relationship to try to help us understand it. And my hope is that I'm going to talk with a group of people over these next few weeks that really do desire to have the very best you version of you. And when it comes to relationship, the very best relationship version that you and your spouse can possibly have. Because bottom line is, we have to set some relationship goals. If you're just floating through relationship. You're not going to accomplish all that God has created you and designed you and equipped you for. So I'm going to give you some very practical things today to start the conversation, and it's going to build over the next few weeks. I promise you, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be amazing. But again, whether you are married, you're single, looking or not looking, you're a student, and you're thinking maybe one day you'll be in that kind of a relationship, I'm going to give you one fundamental goal. And I mean, this is earth shattering. And it's probably not something brand new for anybody. But I want to make sure that we understand what the foundational goal is in relationship. And I'm using Darlene and I as an example. And by the way, I'm not perfect in this relationship. And she's not perfect in the relationship. And, And I'm saying that in sincerity. She's an amazing wife, so don't get me wrong. I'm blessed. But neither of us are perfect. And so we got to walk into this fundamentally understanding a couple of things. And I'm going to set the table with relationship goal number one. Here it comes. Relationship goal number one. Say it with me. Christ-centered. Again, you might be in high school. You might be in college, you may be a single, you might be a divorcee, you might be a widow widower, you might be in a marriage, you might be thinking about marriage. You, wherever you are across the spectrum, relationship goal number one, and I'm only going to talk about goal number one today, is to have your relationship be Christ-centered. By the way, not even in my notes, but I just thought of this. This could be relationship from parents With your children. Christ-centered relationships. Now, 
This is far more than just calling ourselves a Christian. Because in this room, there might be a lot of us in this room, or maybe you're watching by way of the internet, if not all, most of us in this room, if not all, would probably identify ourselves as Christians. This isn't, are you a Christian or not a Christian? This is about, is Christ the center? Now, here's what I will tell you spiritually. Christ can't be the center if you're not a Christian. What I, what, and let me define Christian. Somebody that has given their life in faith to Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about Christian in terms of religion. I'm talking about Christian in terms of relationship. So if we are in relationship with Christ, then it is imperative that relationship goal number one has a central focus point. The center of the relationship is Christ-centered. Because here's what can happen. Again, whether you're single or you're married, all of us center our lives around something or someone. Everyone in this room does, regardless of your age. You've centered your life. Maybe it's around self. And you've centered your life around self. And man, everything in life is about you. I want to make sure that I get this and I do that. And so self can become the center of your universe. It becomes the center of your relationships. It could be your children. Man, I've dealt with a lot of couples, a lot of families, and a lot of kids over my few years in ministry. And and I'll tell you, man, I think one of the the most challenging things, particularly with church-going families, is this difference between relationship-rich kids and experience-rich kids. I'm going to tell you where you need to land every time. Relationship-rich. But all too often, as parents, we think the more experiences we give our kids, the better they're going to be. I'm just going to tell you, man, that is a misnomer. I'm not against experience. I'm telling you, on the authority of the Word of God, the way you process through the Word of God, you see that relationship-rich families are successful, not experience-rich. And that's tough sometimes. Because we try to think, man, i got to get them into every little league sport. i got to get them into dance. i got to get them vocal lessons and piano lessons. And by the way, I'm a fan of all that stuff. I'm not against any of that stuff. But it has to be Christ-centered where relationship is at the foundation. Maybe, Maybe the center of your relationships aren't self or your children. Maybe it's things. Man, it's... I need to make sure I get the new phone every 18 months. I got to make sure I get the new Cadillac every three years. I got to get the newest boat. I got to live in the right neighborhood. And it becomes about things. Maybe maybe it's about image. And you're centered around your career or what people think of you or whatever that is. See... If we don't center ourselves around Christ, our whole relationship will begin to unravel. When marriages are truly centered around Christ, our lives, our marriage, it'll reflect it because it becomes a value of who we are. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was asked... What is the most important thing? And it was, a, it was an attorney asking the question, well-educated. And he said to Jesus, you know, what is the most important thing that we should know here? If you could boil it all down. Here's what Jesus said. Matthew 22, verse 36. Teacher, a reference to Jesus. Which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? By the way. This reference to the law of Moses really isn't about the Ten Commandments, although some would think that is. The law of Moses is about the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So there's five books Moses wrote that give us some insight which lays out kind of the law of God. So Jesus, out of all of this stuff, what's the most important? And Jesus said, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest 
commandment. Can I, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Christ-centered. And, and that phrase doesn't do justice to what Jesus said. Make him the center of your life in every respect. Your heart, your mind, your soul. Now this is critical. If Jesus is the most important thing in your life, then he has to be the center of relationship. Here's why. Whatever is in the center, and I'm going to put some circles on the screen for you. Whatever is in the center of relationship, if it's Christ, it will determine your values and your beliefs. If it's self, it determines the next circle of your life. If if what's at the center of your relationships are your children, then the values and the beliefs will be predicated on that. So if my children are the center of my life, and I put Darlene in the back seat because my kids are in the front seat, metaphorically speaking. Our our son does ride in the front seat. Or our daughters. So I'm not talking about the physical location in in a vehicle. If I set the marriage to the backside and elevate the children above the marriage, I've gotten the priorities out of place. And I'm telling you what I've watched over the years of ministry is parents parent their children, create these experience-rich families, and at the end of the day when the kids are grown and gone, they look at their spouse and go, who are you? Oh, you're the mom to my kids, or you're the dad that took them to all the practices. The relationship-rich families put Christ at the center rather than self or image or things or children because it determines our values and our beliefs. And our values and our beliefs then determine the actions and decisions we make. And again, if my children are first and foremost, and by the way, My kids have high priority in my life. So don't think they don't have a priority in my life. But Christ at the center determines the values and belief system. It's the way we're wired as a family. Why? Because I chose to put Christ first. And that's what I want to challenge you to think through in your relationships. Because when you do and your values and belief system are set with Christ first, then it will determine how you respond, the actions and the decisions that you make. By the way, this is where you spend your money, in the actions and decision compartment. And that's going to be dictated by what's at the center. Are you with me? Is this making any sense? Okay. Then the influence and impact comes. What you're leaving behind, the influence and the impact you have on people in general or another generation or your grandchildren or your kids or their neighbors are determined by what ultimately was at the center of your relationship. That's the point I want to make here. So if you're thinking about getting married or you've gotten married or you're considering it or you're going to stay single, let me just tell you, man, put Christ first. And I can give you a lot of supportive ideas here, but I want to encourage you. Jesus himself modeled singleness. And I think he did pretty good. Now, you're not hearing that you should stay single from me. I'm letting you know that if you are single, that's not a bad thing. You can still make a tremendous contribution. And if you're married, I'm not saying you have to be married. I'm letting you know that whatever state of life you're in, single or married, and I think that's the two categories, you're either single or you're married, that Christ must be at the center of that relationship. So when it comes to our three children, Christ is at the center of the relationship. When it comes to my marriage, Christ is at the center of the relationship. The moment that Darlene becomes the center of the relationship, now my priorities get out of whack. My belief system and my values change, which then impacts the actions and decisions I take. Does that make sense? 
So if I could help you on day number one of this series, if you could lay the foundation that it's Christ-centered, the rest of this is going to come much easier. But when Christ is taken out of the center and that relationship becomes more important or that other person becomes more important, now my values and my belief system get out of whack, which determine my actions and my decisions, and then my impact and my influence have changed. You want to leave a legacy in your life? You want to leave the kind of legacy that makes a mark in life? Put Christ at the center. Allow that to be what drives the relationships. Now, I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask our band to join me on stage, and I'm going to kind of close with a little bit of an illustration here. But I'm going to ask our band to come to the stage and help me out. Uh, we're going to sing a song. I surrender. I love this tune, Darlene. Can you help me out too? I'm just going to use you uh, to help me out. We're just going to make an illustration. So um, I just want to make a point. Okay, so, um, here, come back here with me. <laughs> All right. If Christ is at the center of relationship, and again, I'm only using us an exam- as an example. We, we could use other couples as an example. Does everybody get that? Please don't, don't walk out and go, man, this was a sermon about David and Darlene. Not at all. It's just the best example I have. And you heard me say unequivocally, she's not perfect, I'm not perfect. But God put us together, and we want to do the perfect job as a married couple that we possibly can. So I'm going to give you, how do I go about some of this? And it's going to be a very practical way for you to think about this. If you're going to accomplish relationship goal number one by putting Christ at the center, then I'm just going to tell you it's got to begin with something extremely simple. There's a lot of input I could give you, a lot of advice I could give you on this issue, but I want you to walk away successful today, single or married. So I'm going to give you one illustration that will help you. Pray together. Pastor, I don't don't know if I could pray. My spouse knows... My spiritual condition, I can't pray. Or, or my friend knows, or the person I'm dating knows. Listen, I'm telling you, you want to be successful and accomplish great relationship goals, then you have to start somewhere. Start by praying together, even if it's awkward. And by the way, listen, if you're married, there's far more awkward things you've done than pray together. You, you've exchanged spit. Come on. That's pretty awkward. Now, Darlene and I were talking about this this week. She knew I was, I was going here in this direction, and we, she gave me some input from her perspective, which was extremely helpful because I was going in a whole different direction until I talked to her, and she went, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that's really that good. Uh, I think it would be better to go this direction. And so she really helped me build this. Now, here's what I want to encourage you with when I say, yeah, if you're going to put Christ at the center of all of your relationships, start with one simple tool, prayer. And again, this isn't about if you're great or not great at prayer. Remember, Jesus' closest friends in the New Testament had spent three years with him, and at the end of three years still said, uh, could you teach us how to pray? Because we don't get it. We, we don't know how to do this. So, here would be my advice. If you're starting out in this, keep your prayer short. Does that make sense? Whatever short is to you. It could be 30 seconds, 60 seconds, three minutes, five minutes. Don't walk into it going, okay, honey, we got to get together and we got to pray for an hour. Pastor said pray for, together for an hour. It's not realistic for some. So keep it short. This is how you're going to accomplish this. Keep it consistent. And if you miss a day, don't miss two. So... If you could do these things, here would be my encouragement. The mean, what I mean by keeping it consistent is, and we were talking about this this week, find a place, a time that you can do this. For example, 
Maybe, maybe you guys, when it comes time for a meal, you grab hands and you pray together. Maybe that's your prayer together. Maybe it's right before you go to bed at night, you guys get down on your knees next to your bed and you pray together. You figure that piece out. She and I were talking about it this week. One of the things that we put into our marriage, we said, what if every time we parted from the house, and normally it's me that leaves first, like going to work or going somewhere. What if we just gathered and we prayed? It it would look like this. It's simple, consistent, and if we miss a day, let's not miss two. Does that make sense? I want you to be highly successful in your relationships, specifically if you're a married couple. And again, don't look at pictures of Darlene and I or somebody on Instagram and go, boy, that's what I want. No, you've got what God gave you. Man, and it's awesome. It's not a downer. It's phenomenal because God wove you together. So just find that place. For us, it could be anywhere. Yesterday, it was in a different room in our home. She was leaving. She was coming here to the church. I reached out my hand, and I prayed. Maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and I prayed that God would protect her. She drove over to the church. She'd get everything done as fast as she could so she could come back home. And it was simple. But it allows for the relationship to be Christ-centered rather than us-centered. Because let let me tell you, for me, she could become the center of my world quickly. That's the challenge I have. Thanks, hon. That That was good. Give it up for Darlene. She's amazing. Listen, the center of our world could quickly become our children. Man, we love these guys. Anytime I get to see him playing drums, I love it. And David can quickly become, I I don't even know, can you hear me right now? Okay. He's got monitors in, doesn't he? Yeah. So he could quickly become the center of our world. But then we got Danielle over here who's going, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about me? So we shift and she can become the center. And then Dayla calls on the phone, oh wait, what about me? Listen, when Christ is the center of your relationships, your beliefs and your values now are shaped. Do you get that? If you get the centerpiece off, the beliefs and the values are off. And when the beliefs and the values are, values are off, it impacts your actions and your decisions in a different way. So today, relationship goal number one. I want you to say it with me. Christ-centered. Okay, relationship goal number one? You got it, right? Doesn't mean you've got to figure it out. Doesn't mean you're perfect at it. I'm not. I am a work in progress all the time. I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to learn. I want to continue to be coached. I want to continue to be better. Because I haven't arrived. Our marriage has not arrived. We want it to be better, get better, learn, grow. And that's what we desire for you and your relationships. So I wanted to start today by saying, relationship goal number one, Christ-centered. 